Hey guys, welcome back to our restoration project. So today we're going to take on our Weber 40 IDA carburation. And uh, this video is going to be a little bit different than uh, your basic how to rebuild a 40 Weber IDA. And I'll explain why we're going to do it differently here in a minute. Um, so on this video, we're basically going to focus on uh, aesthetics, uh, how these carburetors should look as close as we can get them to look historically correct for the car and the year. Um, also, we're going to focus on uh, preservation things we can do to uh, get some more longevity built into them and uh, keep them beautiful for a long time because uh, beauty counts uh, and they got to they got to work good. And then also, we're going to focus on uh, some performance enhancement. So. Uh, it's important to know I am not a Weber expert. I also am not a Weber historian, but I have done extensive research on these carburetors over the years. And uh, I think through this video, uh, by the time we get to the end, we'll have a real nice end result that we can be happy with and should be correct for the car. Um, I do have considerable background working with carburation over the years, uh, be it on-road, off-road, performance carburation and even uh, quite a bit of motorcycle carburation. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some of what I learned over the years and we're going to apply it to uh, this set of Weber's here and see if we can't take out some of the finickiness in these carburetors. So the biggest complaint I hear on Weber carburetors is uh, they're really finicky, really temperamental. And you'll see as we put this one together, this one's already done uh, and I've worked out all the issues here. But when we put this one together, you'll be able to see where all this temperament comes from, why they're so finicky, and some of the things we're gonna do here should eliminate some of that and give you a more precise, more predictable airflow running carburetor. So that being said, let's go ahead and uh, get started. We're gonna start with some very basic uh, performance enhancements, blueprinting and polishing, and uh, we'll see exactly what we end up with. Okay, let's have a look at my terrible drawing here and see if I can make some sense as to uh, what the issues are with Weber's or carburetors in general. There's a lot you can uh, draw similarities to from the principles of what we're doing here today. So on this side, this is air coming in the top of the air horns. And in a perfect world, perfect scenario, air would come in the top of the air horns, would travel all the way down through the chokes, through your throttle plates, down through your manifold, into the valve, undisturbed. So you'd have a perfect vacuum broken up by venturis and uh, air fuel mixture would be perfect. There'd be no disturbance of airflow uh, or erratic air coming down through into your valve. On this side here is a representation of on the Weber's and other carburetors that are similar, um, all the different areas that can breach. Uh, you could have a vacuum leak, you could have uh, air bypass through your chokes here. You can have a lot of things that go wrong. So in this scenario, if we have a perfect vacuum, there's not much to adjust here. This is just going to work itself out. It's going to meter correctly, and we're going to be happy with it. But if I drilled a little tiny hole right there, or right here, or right here, uh, you would have a breach in this chamber. This chamber would no longer function properly and predictably, and you would have issues. And that's where all the temperament comes with these style of carburation. So you have, uh, in a perfect scenario, perfect air traveling down one chamber, but in our Weber's here, we've got six chambers, right? So we got, you know, different things that can go on in each one of these. You're trying to adjust out each one as you're going and just can't quite get there. Um, there's not a lot of adjustment on these carburetors. The adjustment really is done through how it's put together. Okay, so that being said, then you have a pretty good understanding of what can happen as far as a breach or uh, some problems in our mating surfaces. So the first thing I'm doing, on my manifolds, I am milling the top and bottom surface, and I'm milling ever so slightly. I'm using a flat surface, some 150 grit sandpaper, and I'm just milling off enough area so that we eliminate any kind of possibilities where we can break a seal. That'd be on the top, the bottom, and on every surface. Uh, because these carburetors are old, you know, so you have corrosion issues, you have warpage issues, you know, so that stuff's got to get worked out. You want to keep the milling to an absolute minimum, and we were able to get a minimum out of these uh, carburetors I'm using here. But still, uh, if we didn't do this, we could have issues even after a rebuild. Let's take a look at a clip and see how that's done. Just a little bit of an opening 
right here, so we'll keep going, but not much farther. Not much coming off of there, but just enough to make the difference. And then just a close-up look at our intake manifold here, so you can see just after lightly brushing it here, right in this area right here, see that? We don't have any contact surface at all. So what that means is if I bolted this down under our heads, um, there's a high likelihood we'd have a small vacuum leak right in this area. to our throttle shaft assembly and uh, we're just going to kind of breeze through this here guys because I want to focus on other things. So what I'm doing here is I'm just doing a basic mock-up in relation to my accelerated pump cam um, and the reason I want to do that is I want to make sure I've got my spring in position here to work the throttle shaft in the correct direction we want to go and then also we have to locate our drift pin in there and there's a couple of holes they provide for this and you want to make sure if you've got everything set up just right and it's going to work out before you set that pin. So everything's pretty good now. I'm using 3-in-1 oil to lubricate the shaft as I put it in there and I'm preloading the end here. Let's take a look at our plates. So these are new old stock by Weber throttle plates and I have not had uh, any luck at all with any aftermarket throttle plates. So if you need a good set of Weber throttle plates, I'm going to put a link below um, check them out because there's only so many left out there. Uh, better get them while you can. Okay, so these are the uh, throttle plate screws we're going to be using. These are from Parts Classic. The throttle shafts are also from Parts Classic and new end springs here. And uh, really good quality throttle shafts. Okay, setting up my end play, I want to pull all the way to the right, go all the way to the left, and then take it right in the middle and set my screws. Okay, so this part right here is probably going to be the most important to set up your throttle plates and get the best performance out of them. So what we want to do, if you're using good throttle plates, you'll have a very small amount of light bleed through this area here. If you're using aftermarket, um, you, you could have some issues there. But uh, we got our Weber's in there, so we're going to be uh, about as good as we're going to get. So what you can do with this plate, you can move it this way, or you can move it this way, or you can turn it this way to seat that thing 100% in the opening. So what we want to do is get it seated with our screws loose. Once we like it, we'll tighten it down and we'll do the same thing to all three. Then we'll take a look at it once we're done with our light and see how everything balances out. Okay, so after fooling around with those for about an hour and a half in the dark, I think we finally got them balanced and where we want them. So the thing is, if you don't get these right where you need to have them centered, seated, and in perfect relationship to each other, what's going to happen is you're going to try and compensate through your adjustments outside here, and you're never going to get there. So really, this is where most of the adjustment is done right here. And you also, you got to make sure you have lateral in play when all these are seated. So 
quite a bit of fooling around, but that's what it's going to take to get a nice balanced car. Okay, and then moving on then, so everything's kind of got a coating of 3-in-1 oil on our screws and threads. We're snug down. So what I want to do is I want to apply some thread locker to our screws, and I want to do that one at a time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that screw. I'm going to rinse that out with carburetor cleaner, let it dry, apply my thread locker, and screw it back in snug. And then I'm going to do that, switching them out one at a time all the way down. So let me get that done. We'll take a look at it. Okay, so we've installed some carburetor feet here. These are going to be helpful from this point forward. Also, our thread locker 271 is uh, set up and cleaned up. So now we're going to adjust our base idle. So we're going to move this lever arm just enough to cover our first set of progression holes. Okay, so we're just exposing it now. So our setting is going to be right. Right there. So at a glance, it doesn't even look like our throttle plates are open. But if we shine our light behind there, you can see we actually have quite a bit of airflow making its way through there, even with that subtle adjustment. Uh, very subtle adjustment, but very critical to the performance on these carburetors. And then moving on to our jetting package. So here's a page out of the manual uh, for our carburetors. The uh, scribble on the right is the difference for an S-carb setup. And then there's some information at the bottom here, which we're going to be following to some degree. Um, so this is the jet sizing we're going to be using on these carburetors. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so our air adjustment screws, our original refinish. You can see the one on the left there, the nickel plated. That's actually going to be an aftermarket in comparison. Our air bypass screws are also original, and that would be a aftermarket bypass screw. Our emulsion tubes are from Parts Classic and uh, per spec. Our main jets and jet holders are new replacements from Parts Classic. Also, we're using new ceiling rings there. So our accelerator pump squirters, these are original with new ceiling rings and jets are original. Also, our idle jets and holders are also original. Original progression port plugs and drain plugs with new ceiling rings. And then I'll be applying just a smidge of mineral base grease to all these threads as we run them in. That'll help prevent any damage. Okay, next we're going to roll through our accelerator pump housing and uh, its assembly. So everything has been prepped, uh, original hardware. We're using a diaphragm from Redline and original linkage refinished. And for lubrication, we're going to be using a petroleum-based grease here, here, at this point here, on our cam. Also over here, we're going to uh, use 3-in-1 oil on our shaft here, right here and here and also down in our ball area and some petroleum-based grease right here where our cam's going to ride.
Okay, and then next we're going to check our pump volume to see exactly how much comes out of there under full throttle. So what I'm looking for is a half cc adjustment. And using uh, denatured alcohol, we're just filling up our well. All right, let's check our volume. Okay, so we're just slightly under a half cc. If anything, we want to crank that up a bit. So let's richen it up. Which is okay, we'll open her up all the way. One shot. Let go. That's better. That looks pretty good. Half CC, I think we're good. So here's a sketch of our float and needle set uh, with the measurements we're going to be going with and the proper geometry to set everything up here. Um, we're choosing these measurements here because my base gasket is uh, Victor Reince and a little bit thicker than half millimeters, like 0.7 millimeters. So I think with these measurements, we'll be able to hit it right on target. Perfect. That one also is right on the money. And then uh, setting up our needles is really quite simple. I'm going to set them up for 18.5 uh, from the bottom side using a selection of shims to get there. And so what that's going to look like. I'm going to be upside down. So we're right at 18.5 right there. And then before we close it up, just for fun, let's just see how, um, even though we're supposed to do this with the engine running and warm, but let's just fill this float bowl and see exactly what happens to our vial and needle and seat. So with our float right between the lines on our vial, so right there is where it touches the needle. So we're just down to some basic items here to bolt on and uh, finish these guys up. Let me just roll through this quickly and we get it put together. We'll have a look at it and uh, give you my final thoughts on these and a final tip on what you can do to keep your Weber's happy.
And then one last tip here where we can keep our carburetors in check as we uh, drive them and they slightly run out of adjustment. So what I'm doing here is just making an example sheet of, let's say we go through the tune-up process and we get everything set just where we want it. Right now we have everything marked with our yellow at 12 o'clock. Um, let's just say uh, through our final setup, our right carburetor, left carburetor, our yellow lines end up in these positions here. So we're not paying attention to these ones. We're paying attention to our 12 o'clock. And then we're marking a reference 12, 3, 6, and 9. So what's going to happen is eventually you're going to get a vibration. The screw is going to unback itself. This is going to move and it's going to create havoc on your adjustment. Uh, without a quick visual reference to know where they should be once you've done your tune-up, it's going to be difficult to get back here without going through this whole process all over again. So this is one way you can get back there quickly. You can quickly identify if something has moved here or here. You can quickly reset it, and your car should be back up and running just the way it should. Okay, well, I think we finally got ourselves a working set of carburetors here. be interesting to see how they adjust out once we get them on the car. Uh, literally years in the making to bring these carburetors back to life. I've got four carburetors here. I've had several sets of manifolds I've had to go through to find a set that would be good enough to use. Uh, tons and tons of new parts, refinished original parts, literally over 250 hours to bring these guys back to quiet. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next video.